All right, uh, boys. Wait, what are what what are you guys? You guys, you guys. Yeah, I, I haven't come up with a good nickname for you guys yet. So today. Uh, this is going to be episode two and a half because we're going to talk to all of the characters and get a hold of their backstory. So first we're going to talk to Darius Oliviera, the long-standing EXO of your company. EXO means he's just second in command. Speak with Darius to learn about the command center, the barracks, and the captain's Please. quarters. It's always good to see you at Ops. Fox, what can I do for you? There's quite a bit of dialogue here. This is not essential to the game. But if you want to know more of the story, as well as I'll be reading the mechanics, and what that means is if you buy this game, you could skip this part, because you'll have already heard it here. I want to know more about our debt situation. Yeah, sure, that's fair. And I'm glad you're taking an interest. I've got time to get through the nuts and bolts of it with... I've gotten time to get to the nuts and bolts of it if you do. What do you want to know? Remind me why we took so many loans in the first place. How much time have you got? I mean, we've been hit with a thousand expenses since we were forced to flee Coromadir, but I guess you're mostly more interested in the big ticket items. Well, first and foremost, there's the Leopard. We still owe a lot of money on this ship, and losing her isn't an option. Then you've got all the assorted fallout from our impromptu trip across the frontier. Jump ship passage, docking fees, miscellaneous travel expenses, all paid for on credit. As if we had a choice. There's more to it than that. There's more that I could get to into that. The loan we took out to set up the Markham's family, etc., etc. But that'd be gilding the lily at this point. The fact is, we're in a lot of trouble with a lot of lenders. But hey, we're mercenaries. We live for trouble. So, uh, I'm sure many of you guys can relate you know, the idea of having to hit the grind and got the the banks are hot on your heels. It's uh, certainly a, a common story. I don't know about in the rest of the world, but certainly in the United States, the, uh, you know, the low and lower mid-class always has this issue. Who are we in debt to exactly? I want names. How about I give you the top three? First, you've got Blue Horizon. That's the big commercial bank on Learton. They're the ones that own the lease on this ship. Then there's Injury Consortium. They've got people everywhere, but they're based somewhere in Merrick space. We borrowed from one of their associates to make the jump away from Coromadir on the day of the coup. Finally, you've got Lockdown Lending. They're a frontier outfit from Haster, and they're about as crooked as they come. Now, I wouldn't normally do business with an outfit like Double L, but we didn't have a choice. They made a deal with Blue Horizon to buy half of our debt. So that's the big three. A commercial bank, a shadowy financial consortium, and a bunch of leg breakers in cheap suits. And each of them dangerous in their own way. That's enough of talk of money. Let me ask you something else. Be my guest. What do you need? Oh, and let me tell you, I'm going to take a drink of Mountain Dew periodically from all the reading. Like, right now. Ah. Let's do this one next. Got a few minutes. I'd like to catch up. Yeah, sure. I got time to talk. Before any of this started, you worked for the Arano Royal Guard. Tell me about it. It was more than just a deployment. It was a full campaign. High Lord Tamati, who is Kamea's father, gave us the job back in 19, which is not 2019. 3019. He was supposed to be assisting the Royal Guard to round up and eliminate a pirate clan on Fjalder. The Commander Markham thought it would be easy money. Turned out to be anything but. We lost a dozen mech warriors in the three months of the Fjalder campaign. Had to hose them out of their cockpits. Yeah, when, uh, sometimes you'll hear the phrase, uh, I had to spray out a cockpit. That basically means that the cockpit was hit directly with weapons fire and that obliterated the pilot. Like the pilot was like reduced to chunks of meat. Uh, would have been more if it wasn't for Siraju. He saved our asses on more than one occasion. Hopefully, don't demonetize me, YouTube. That's not even the worst word. On more than one occasion. Went out of his way to do it. And the thing is, we he didn't have to. We weren't under his protection. We were high, We were the hired help. So this is a good point here. Like I told you before that mercenaries are typically looked down upon. Not always, but 
mercenaries are typically not of noble birth, and even somebody like our character are, even though we're of noble, we're like deposed, you know, bankrupt. We're like half of a noble, and the houses t they tend to look at mercenaries as like, oh, you're 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 the filthy, deniable assets that if you fail the mission, we could say oh, mercenaries. We would never hire mercenaries. That that's crazy talk. A lot of people in Mastiff's position would have used us as cannon fodder, but that wasn't his way. He treated us as if we were his own. He was a good man, Fox, as good as they come. Tell me a bit about yourself, Darius. Where'd you come from? I grew up on Nassau Heights. It's one of the hab stations orbiting Artru. Thirty decks of economic stratification with corporate suits on the upper decks and everyone else crammed into the lower ones. My old man was a dockhand. We lived on deck 28, two levels up from the bottom with the other station maintenance personnel. 12 hours a day, six days a week, my dad would load and unload cargo shuttles, vacuum sealed quilly, quiller, quillier nutrient paste for people like us and luxury goods for the suits upstairs. The old man must have unloaded a thousand cases of Casildan eel rope, plump succulent eggs uh, the size of melon balls. Never got to taste any though. Any one of those tins would have cost him half a year of half a year's wages. Anyways, Fox, I don't want to saddle you with my life story. Suffice to say that I got an eyeball, an eye full of what I didn't want to be on the Sal Heights. And I did what I had to to change my circumstance. By the age of 16, I struck out on my own. I left that station with a handful of skills, an enormous web of contract contacts, and a rucksack full of expensive caviar. Did he steal it? Is that what happened? And once I made it to Nassau Heights, I never looked back. I'd like to ask you something else. Be my guest, what do you need? You got some questions about running the company. So this is where it teaches you how to play the game. I may not look over these just because I can teach you better than than the game can. Let me just run through one of them to see what we're dealing with. Remind me what I need to know about mercenary contracts. Outfits like ours depend on the mercenary review board to pro certify. Yeah, this is going to not be, uh... Like, this is not, uh... Th this really is just tutorial stuff. That's not a big deal. Well, that's enough of that. Let's go talk to the next person. I'll see ya. I mean, if you want me to read the tutorial stuff, post down in the comment section, and I'll read you the tutorial stuff in another .5 episode. So let's go over to Yang. What can I do for you? Hey, ya, uh, boss. Welcome to the Mech Bay, my own little piece of heaven right here on board the ship. Something I can help you with? I want an assessment on the Leopard. How much trouble are we in? Dunno, I mean, we're doing okay for the moment, but give it a few months, maybe a year. You know how it goes. Eventually everything starts falling apart. Maybe our drive system will give out, maybe some debris will perforate the hull, who knows. But on that day, we're gonna need to be able to cover our repair costs, and if we can't, well, that'll be that. I got a few questions about the mech bay. Uh, yeah, hit me with them. I'll do what I can to answer, I mean... I don't want to wax poetic or nothing, but the mech bay is where the magic happens, boss. It's the beating heart of a mercenary outfit. So this is another tutorial. He's just going to teach you, like, how to, like, customize your mechs. So we'll skip that. I'll talk about it in time myself. Tell me a little bit about yourself. How'd you wind up in this crew? That's a long story, boss. Shortest version I can give you. I signed on after my... After I served my term in the Third Secession War fighting for the Capellan Confederation. That makes sense. The Capellan Confederation is heavily influenced by uh, Chinese, by, Ch by China. Uh, they have like a very Han Dynasty thing going on and with a name like Yang, he might be a, uh, a citizen of the Capellan Confederation. The Third Secession War? Uh, let's see. Oh, I could point at these and they, they actually give me contextual hints. I just learned something. The Third Secession War began in 2866 when Coordinator Miyogi Kurita, that's the Draconis Combine, responded aggressively to rumors of the Draconis Combine's weakness 
But the fighting spread to the entire inner sphere because the Secessor State's military capabilities had been dramatically reduced in the previous two secession wars. This conflict proceeded at a slower pace and with less intensity than the earlier wars. Treaties signed in 3020 and 3022 limited the fighting, and in 3025, the Third Secession War had effectively ended. So I believe the time is after the Third Secession War. They're called the Secession Wars because after the Star League fell, the five primary superpowers, the Capellan Confederation, the Federated Sons, the Draconis Combine, uh, the Free Worlds League, and the Lyran Commonwealth, all of them wanted to fill the power vacuum that the Star League left behind. None of them more so than the Draconis Combine. The Combine are, they're the most, all, all of the successor states are militaristic, but the Combine is especially militaristic and they believe that they are the sole heirs to the, uh, to the Star League. And so, those five superpowers, because they believe they were next in line to replace the Star League, they are the successors. And so the wars between them to prove who is going to be the dominant power became known as the Secession Wars. Sometimes the, the various powers are referred to as the Successor Lords or the Successor States. Very, there's a lot of names for the same thing in this game, but that's kind of what gives it like a, a realistic organic feel. But the Third War, according to this, uh, makes sense. It was a smaller war or a slower war because they had just been beating each other senseless and they're not able to rebuild and scrap their mechs back together at the rate they could in the past. The Secession War is certainly good for mercenary work because even in between Secession Wars, there's still always hot spots going on, especially at the border of the major superpowers. After the the Three Secession Wars, I believe the next major event in Battletech history is also the most famous event, and that would be the Clan Wars. Uh, no one, you know, like, I don't think... I think they are, that is the most famous point in Battletech history. No one is going to know more about Battletech than the Clan Wars. Like, it's just, it's a very, very famous, favored, fan favorite part of the Battletech history. I like this one. I like the first three Secession Wars uh, because it's th the first three Secession Wars are like vanilla Battletech. It's really classic technology. Very, very little super high-tech Star League tech. Star League tech is like this like treasured hyper-advanced technology from the time of the Star League. It's kind of like the time of the original 151 Pokemon in Pokemon Red and Blue. Whereas when you get to the clans, that's when you start introducing all these crazy ultra... And like, the, the clans have more advanced mechs than even the Star League. Because, I mean, I, I guess it's not a spoiler, but the clans are the Star League. The original Star League. Like, the, the clans represent the return of the ousted Star League. So they did not go into the technological dark age that the Inner Sphere did, where they basically bombed each other into lower technology. The clans instead advanced even further. And so they came with all brand new, never before seen battle mechs, weaponry and systems that no one had ever seen before. Their mechs are so powerful that they're typically regarded as being 10 tons heavier than an Inner Sphere counterpart, meaning if my 45 ton, what do you call it, uh, Blackjack ran into a 45 ton clan mech, I should be regarding it as if it were a 55 ton mech in Inner Sphere equivalents because the, uh, the clan mechs are just so much more advanced in every way. They're faster, better armored. They have much more advanced heat sinking capabilities. They've got um, very advanced weaponry. Th their weapons are just like extremely high quality. They're just, I can't stress how much more advanced the clan weapons are. There is a fourth secession war. I believe that's the Fedcom Civil War, which is another pretty famous moment in Battletech history, the Fedcom Civil War. Anyways, let's get back to this. Where are you from originally? I'm gonna take a soda too. Brian, in the Confederation, you may have heard our claim to fame, the Crowley Lizard Cow. No? Well, trust me, they're delicious. Crowley Lizard Cow. 
an edible reptile indigenous to the planet Brian. The meat of the Crowley Lizard Cloud is considered a delicacy, and it is one of Brian's few planetary exports. So I didn't know you could actually point to these as contextual clues. So yeah, he's definitely, he's definitely, um, he's very, I mean, you, you could tell you even by his, the, the, uh, the structure of his eyes, he's of Chinese descent. So he's definitely from the Confelling Confederation. Anyway, as the stories goes, Brian is a nice place once. A tourist spot big with hikers and fishing enthusiasts. Pale blue skies, emerald green seas, and booming agricultural business. You know the works. I never knew it that way, though. Stefan Ameris got to it a couple centuries before I was born, and, well, that was that. This is the guy who started the fall of the Star League, Stefan Ameris. Born in two... Born in 2017, died in 2079. As president of the Rimworld Republic, Stefan Ameris expanded the Republican army and placed Republican agents in key positions throughout the Star League. He fostered a close relationship with Richard Cameron while the First Lord was in his minority. When Cameron came of age, Ameris guided him towards policies that would move Alexander Kerensky's SLDF, which is the Star League Defense Force, away from Terra and place Republican forces there instead. With these preparations in place, Stefan Ameris murdered Richard Cameron on December 27th, 2766, and declared himself First Lord, beginning the Ameris Civil War. Ah, yes, yeah, so that's how it happened. Uh, Alexander Kerensky was basically the supreme commander of the Star League Defense Forces, or the SLDF. And in the intro cutscene, there's a scene of the King Crab and a bunch of guys just marching. That uh, Alexander Kerensky was famous for piloting a King Crab, and that's him leading the ousted Star League in the Great Exodus. The people who fled, the Star League Defense Force that fled in this Great Exodus would one day become the clans. With these preparations in place, oh, he murdered him. Kerensky raised the Rimworld's Republic and returned to Terra to defeat Ameris' forces and capture him. Stefan Ameris was executed by Firing Squad in 2779. His remains were donated to the medical school of the University of New Samarkand. Interesting. As the story goes, Bryant used to have enormous global orbital mirrors. Storm inhibitors, they called them. The Star League put them in place when Amaris took the civil the systems in his civil war. He had his troops use them for target practice. Without those mirrors, Bryant returned to his natural state, a miserable little ball of windblown dirt, actively hostile to human life. The Star League. From 2570 to 2780, the Star League was an interstellar council formed between the Terran hegemony, the five great houses of the Inner Sphere. Those are the five great houses are the successor lords, you know, the, the, the Capellans, the, you know, the Caridans, Steiner, the House Davian, all of those guys. They're the five great houses and the territorial states of the periphery. The periphery are all of the kingdoms outside of the Inner Sphere. The Magistry of Canopus is one of them. The stability and prosperity of the Star League led to a flourishing in civilization and technology. The Star League ended in civil war when the leader of the Rimworld's Republic, Stefan Amaris, murdered the First Lord in a bid to usurp his position. The First Lord is the leader of the Star League. That's their, that's their head of state. The original one was, uh, I believe, Ian Cameron? Yeah, Ian Cameron was the first, first, the first, first Lord, and he is also, um... The, he's also the brainchild of the Star League. Uh, he, he's the one who pitched the idea, came up with the, the concept of it. By the time I came along, the only place where people could live in relative safety were the planet's poles. Of course, you can't fit a planet's entire population into a handful of cities at its poles. There isn't enough space no matter how far you dig or how tall you build. A lot of people, mostly the poor, died in the early days. There's still a lot of overcrowding in Bryant cities, even now. That's my child in a nutshell. Way too many people jabbed into a tiny claustrophobic space with nowhere to go but off planet. I cleared out of I cleared out of there as fast as I could and never looked back. Gotta admit though, I do miss the taste of lizard cow. Hmm. Uh, tell me about your time in the military. Who'd you serve with? The second St. Eve's Lancers, first battalion under Major Ling. We saw more action than most. The arm of a, the, the arm, if you'll notice here, he's got a bionic arm. 
The arm is a souvenir of my time in service. I lost the original back in 3010 on St. Loris. Let's get some context. Second St. Ives Lancers. A well-connected and well-financed regiment, the Lancers operated along the Capellan Confederation's Rimward Quarter, fending off pirates and conducting raids into the Free Worlds League in 2030, 2025. Its three battalions are allocated to the defense of St. Eve's Maladar and St. Loris. And here's St. Loris. St. Loris is an important agricultural center in the Capellan Confederation. In 3010, a notable battle took place between the 2nd St. Eve's Lancers, or St. Ives, St. Eve, I don't know, and two regiments from the elite Seti Hussars of the Federated Sons. Much of the planet's vital wheat crop was destroyed. The Federated Sons are kind of the analog to the United States. They're very big on giving people democracy and, well, not democracy. They're very big on giving people freedom at the end of a gun. So, you know, um, they're also, they tend to be viewed as very self-righteous as they believe, you know, like their way of freedom and whatnot is superior to everyone else's. So a lot of people view the Federated Sons as, um, well, not a lot. The opponents of the Federated Sons view them as kind of like uh, a hypocritical, holier-than-thou types. Whereas the allies of the Federation Sons, they do certainly do view them as uh, saviors and uh, deliverers of freedom. So it just depends on who you ask. You know, when we first arrived at St. Loris, I love the place. It's an agricultural world, sort of a breadbasket for the neighboring systems. Green fields, rolling hills, you get the picture. We just walked out of hell on Kittery. The Fed Rats drove us out in 05 with our tails between our legs, so it looked like paradise to us. I remember kicking back in the mech bay, my feet propped up on the engine block, sipping on a snifter of ambergris vermouth. Not a bad way of spending a sunny afternoon. Got us some vocab here. First, Kittery. Do they have a bunch of kitties there or something? Previously under Capellan control in 3005, this inhospitable jungle world was conquered by the Federated Sons, which are which is House Davian. A resistance movement kept the world a war zone for many years. In 3020, House Liao returned and waged war for more permanent liberation. So far, it had succeeded only in creating lasting enmity between the defending first Kittery borders and the invading forces of the St. Eve's Armored Cavalry. Fedrats. This is the Federated... Oh, Fedrat. A person living in or whose national origin is the Federated Sons. Yeah, so a Fedrat, yeah. Basically a, a resident of the Federated Sons. Ambergris Vermouth. Ambergris Vermouth is a red and usually is red and usually found in tiny bottles in port shops. Getting larger bottles takes connections. Getting a crate of it well. Anyway, turned out the Federated Sons weren't done with us, yes. We were barely a month into deployment when they sent in the SETI Hussars to burn us out. I'm sure that there were sound strategic reasons for House Davian to want St. Loris, but it sure felt personal to me. Federated Sons. This is one of the five successor states. Yeah, we could, do, you know, we, we know, I've told you, that we could learn more about them later. The Seti Hussars, created by the Federated Sons in an effort to replicate a light horse style regiment of the Star League era. And when they say horse, they don't mean like horseback, they mean like fast moving armor units. The combination of mechs and mounted infantry and uh, was ideal for conducting swift raids. The Hussars also encouraged personnel to dine together regardless of rank or branch of service, prompting a high re-enlistment rate. House Davian. By Freedom Sword. That's the, uh, that's the icon of the Federated Sons. It's like a sword with a sunburst in the background. From the capital world of New Avalon, the Davian family led the Federated Sons to become one of the largest and most militarily powerful states in the inner city. The Federated Sons' motto, by freedom swords, illustrate their self-image as a nation. The champion of freedom, democracy, and human rights. So I guess they do bring democracy to people, technically. I'm sure it's a very specific brand of democracy, though. Although the reality is not so clear-cut, in addition to being military power, the Federated Sun is home to New Avalon Institute for S of Science, which is NAES for short, the, uh, the premier research and development center of the 31st century. Long story short, one of their scouts managed to slip through a perimeter and hit my mech bay. 
I was tinkering around in a Centurion custom-made rumble seat at the time. Being surrounded by all that armor is the only reason I made it out alive. Still, I didn't make it out unscathed. I lost two of my favorite assistants in my own right arm. Now I've got this ugly thing grafted onto me as a reminder. Rumble seat. An optional secondary passenger seat that can be built into the control area of a battle mech. Rumble seats are positioned away from the control systems and ejection equipment. Those who ride in them have no control over the mech itself and are utterly at the mercy of the mech warrior in the cockpit. Interesting. Uh, why'd you leave the Capellan Confederation? We're getting a lot of information out of Yang. After my tour was duty up, you mean? I don't know, it was just time to change. Besides, the place wasn't for me anymore. In a way, it never really was. I learned a lot from my time in service. Got a first-hand view of the elitist bull crap. It's not docking demonetized. <laughs> that saturates Capellan culture. How it rewards highborn idiots at the common people's expense. Speaking as thoroughly common man, that didn't sit right with me. When my tour was over, I packed up my things and made a beeline for the periphery. Seemed like a good place as any to find a new beginning. Um, what can we say here? Um, you'll never really get away from the aristocracy, Yang. Hell, I was born a noble. Yeah, but you're a competent noble, and you're not afraid to get your hands dirty. At the end of the day, that's all I really care about. I wonder how many times I watched talented engineers get passed over for promotion so some idiot could, with a title could advance. Too many to count. For what it's worth, I'm glad you made that choice. You brought my mech back from the brink more than once. Yeah, way more than once if memory serves. Still, I appreciate the kind words. For what it's worth, I'm happy to be here. With this crew, going career military would have been an enormous mistake. In your position, I probably would have done the same. Let's talk about something else. Okay, I think we're finally done with Yang. So in the last episode, episode two, I, I didn't really get a chance to go over the customizations and what they mean. Um, customizations, God, that's one of the biggest parts of Battletech. Uh... I, I probably should dedicate an, a, a primary episode to talking more about customization, but there's way more to it. I just talked about the idea of tonnage. There's so much more to it than that. But let's go talk to Sumire now. How can I be of service, Commander? Hey, Commander, something I can do for you. Does the decision we made about uncertified contracts satisfy your concerns? My concerns won't be satisfied until our creditors have been paid and the loan sharks are off our backs. But this is a step in the right direction, and that makes me happy. I'm not blind to the risk that uncertified contracts entail. By the way, I mean. I, I know what we're doing is dangerous, but it's the best chance that we've got to dig ourselves out of this hole. I've got some questions about... This is probably a tutorial. Yeah, so this is tutorial. I'm collecting stories about the crew. Tell me about yourself. Well, I'm from a noble family like you. Okay, so we got two nobles on here. We're old money, made our fortune out in... I've never been able to... This is another nation state, and I have never been able to pronounce their name. The... The... The Rassel Hag... The... The Rassel Hagui... Rassel Hag... The Raga... Those guys. I've never been able... Like, like let's, um... Let's go take a look at the... The Rassel Hagui... These guys here. The f Raz Rat ra the the free Raz Safwe these guys. I've never been able to pronounce their name. <laughs> the then repatriated to the Tarian Concordat. That's another periphery world. Well, well these are periphery. They, here we go. A minor interstellar state conquered seven hundred years ago by the Draconis combined, now officially known as the 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 mili the these guys military district. The Tarian Concordat. That's another faction we actually can do work for or against them. That's where I grew up. I'm not sure if this is the kind of stuff you're up to here, but we could talk about whatever. I'm not shy. Uh, where in the Concordat were you from? I grew up in New Vandenberg. It's a nice enough place, I suppose. Do you like birds? Sure, I guess. Then you'd like New Vandenberg. It's basically one big aviary. Something like two-thirds of the native fauna has feathers, flutters on the wind, and splatters its excrement across every available surface. Naturally, the original colonists adopted the feathery little monsters into the culture, and those of us that came after were kind of stuck with it. Statues, fountains, murals, you name it, just a giant feathery screeching alien birds. If the system had a motto, it'd be squawk. Wonder how they taste. Uh, I get the picture. 
You sure? Because I could keep going. I hate birds is what I'm saying. That may be a popular opinion for pilots, but I'll stand by it till the day I die. Where'd you learn to pilot a leopard, by the way? The Torian Naval Institute on New Vandenberg, well, among other places. It's a big campus. The low-gravity training station orbiting Lam Lompoc was my second home for a time. TNI, Torian Naval Institute, flight training isn't usually open to civilians, but my parents had good credit back then, because she's a noble, and they can name drop Protector Caldera, and, and that'll get you pretty far in the Concordat for a while, anyway. Protector Col Thomas Caldera. Born 2984, Thomas Calderon succeeded his mother, mother Zarantha Calderon, as protector of the Tarian Concordat in 3017. House Calderon leaders are known for their pragmatism and sound judgment. Thomas is no exception. That's, so one thing about this universe, Battletech, is when... Maybe I'm spoiled, but when I play other games, they feel very shallow, like there's no history in the world, like the world has not been lived in. There is decades of lore to the point that they've got dates down to, like, sometimes down to the month and the day, in Terran time at least, and it gives the world a feel like, like it's really happening. Some people may find this to be a lot of fluff, but that's why all of this is optional. Like, that's why I'm making it a .5 episode, but, uh, like, a lot of, like, Dragon Age. People consider that a good game. I don't think it's a bad game. I like the Dragon Age, but... Dragon Age is so shallow in its background and historic events, like, they can't really name drop dates. They can't talk about, like, historic figures, like, they can't drop people's names and dates and places and cities and towns like Battletech can to such an extent that it feels like this is a real place. Like, think about the way, like, Yang and Sumire are describing their home worlds and whatnot. They describe it with such detail and the writing is so casual like they're just like Josh she's talking about how it's basically this like giant like bird poop world it's uh it just makes it feel so much more believable than most games that I play but now in defense of other games BattleTech has been around since the 80s and it has hundreds of novels so there is a reason why there is so much history but you just notice it so much in, well, not in every Battletech game, but when the Battletech game is directed by the original creator, Jordan Weissman, this game is made by Hairbrain Schemes, and Hairbrain Schemes is Jordan Weissman's new company ever since he uh, left FASA. So, obviously, since he is the guy who co invented like, I believe he had one buddy who helped him invent Battletech, but Jordan Weissman is considered the, um, the, what do you call it, the Bray? He, he's considered the father of Battletech. And since he's involved with it, of course it's going to be... Th there's going to be a lot of uh, care taken into the story elements. The other cadets in my class weren't especially happy sharing air with a civvy. But they couldn't say much. I was nobility and they were... Meh, meh. That's what happens when you're nobility. You get to, like, throw your weight around. Everybody sort of kept me at arm's length, so I had plenty of time to concentrate on my studies. I got my certification in both dropship and jumpship operation in four years. I even tried working on a commercial jump crew for a while, once upon a time. The people were fun, but it wasn't for me. The ratio of flying to violent, violent jump sickness skewed hard and wrong direction. Uh, dropship, that's what we're in, used to like transport uh, our battle mechs. Jumpship was the thing that we connected to and it warped around for faster than light travel. What can you tell me about House Meyer? You're looking at it. My parents are both gone. Blood cancer and heart disease, respectively. Both treatable, but they were out of money at that point, so into the ground they went. Ditto my brother David, who went off to serve in the Third Secession War and never came back. Uh, the, uh, we could say, I'm no stranger to loss myself, given that uh, our parents have died as well, so we have something in common. Yeah, I'm sure you're not. Nobody is, really. It's a rough galaxy. David was 13 years older than me and had a foot out the door before I turned three. And my parents, well, they raised me by proxy in the traditional noble fashion. There was no real bond there even when I was young. None of this is to say that my folks were bad people. They weren't. They were just doing what they knew. Their upbringing had been outsourced just like mine. Yeah, nobles have very 
uh, distant relationships from their family, typically where their family, so that they could focus on their noble duties and their children can be like brought up by like instructors, basically. Anyway, that's all I got to say about my family. They're gone. I'm here. The end. So, you got another question, or should we get back to our duties? Your family came from Raso Raga Waga Baga. It was a long time ago, but yeah, as my parents told it, we were landowners on Pom de Terre. It's a agricultural world, sort of a breadbasket out of the Draconis Combine, another one of the uh, successor states. Ah, uh, yes, I know that Pom de Terre means potato. My ancestors came from the planet Potato, but it took some time for me to accept that, but hey, here we are. Anyway, moving on. House Meyer's holdings were meager, but the value of that land was astronomical. For minor nobility, we were really very wealthy. And then the Third Secession War broke out. The pol political rhetoric got ugly. House Meyer didn't want a single part of what was happening, so my ancestors emptied their accounts and ran. As a rule, House Corita takes a really dim view of nobles who cut and run. Words like traitor and defector start getting ar thrown around. In the Combine, you really don't want to be on the receiving end of allegations like that. If there's a reason for that, the Combine is heavily, heavily influenced by, like, Imperial Japanese uh, culture. So, like, you know, in Japan, if you were a traitor, well, really in all feudal society, well, if you're a traitor in a lot of societies, traitor's not good, but especially in the feudal societies like in 1600s Japan. So that makes sense though. So she is, she's of Japanese descent, like I thought. So even though she's from the, um, the Rasahaga Waga Republic and then, and then she moved to the Torian Concordat, uh, the Draconis Combined conquered the Rasahaga Waga, <laughs> that place. So it, uh, that's probably what it means. So she's probably of, um, She's possibly of, uh, of Japanese descent, which is why her name is Sumire. Um, I wouldn't be standing here today if House Calderon hadn't granted my successors asylum in the Concordat. In all likelihood, House Meyer would have been wiped out before I was even born. Uh, let's go, House Karita. Honor the Dragon. House Karita has dominated the Draconis Combine since its founding in 2319 by Shiro Karita. Uh, who imbued the state with its strong Japanese culture. Personal honor and self-reliance bordering on xenophobia are hallmarks of Koreadan policy, embracing the way of the warrior. The Draconis Combine has had a long history of antagonism with an aggression against its neighbors. Yeah, the, uh, uh I, you, let me give you an idea what we're dealing with here. The Draconis Combine, all, all the successor states are quite proud, but, uh... Battletech Sarna, but in particular, the the Draconis Combine, let's go to Totem Mechs. I'll find some there. Totem Mech. Let's see. Totem Mechs. Let's see. Um, let's look at some of the... You'll see what I mean when I find some of the... The Hata... Here it is. The Hata Moto Chi. So... Once again, the old back-of-the-day art style. As you can tell, this battle mech is designed to look like a samurai warrior. And it's the design is it doesn't help it fight or anything, but it's designed to represent the Japanese culture because the um the the Draconis Combine are extremely proud of their heritage. Here's another one, the I can't pronounce Japanese words, the 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 the, the Hitosume Kozo. Uh, this one even has, like, a battle standard on it. Once again, like, specifically designed to look like a, uh, a samurai warrior. Uh, the, the, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce these. Another one, once again, it's, these are called totem mechs because totem mechs are basically designed to physically embody the spirit of your people. Like, here's, uh, here's another one, the Shiro, probably named after their successor or their founder. It's specifically designed, it's a mech that's designed to be emblematic of what your people stand for. And so that's why the mechs are designed, even though it's probably more expensive to be fancy like this, and it does, this doesn't help them fight any better, but... Typically, the pilots are their most honored pilots. And remember, these guys are like knights. They're like samurai. 
So a lot of them are okay. Like, to, to give you an idea, okay, let's do, um... Uh, I'll have to cut this out if this gives me something not safe for work, but let me go. Um, knight, armor, cod piece, and some of them are very phallic looking, just to show you that it was... Okay, here we go. This is a real suit of knight's armor that is clearly designed to look like a penis. Clearly. And why... It's a real suit of armor. It's not fake. Why would they do that, though? Like, why would they do that? It's just to show you that the, the people who had the money to build their custom suits of armor, they would put on ornamentation on it that is not functional, but in this case, it was just there to, like, demonstrate their masculinity. Like, look how big my, like, mega, like... I mean, like, look at this thing. This thing is crazy. It's like a giant metal dick. It's, uh... It's crazy, but... I just want to point out that it's not unrealistic for warriors, and in this case battle mechs, to have unnecessarily over-the-top ornamentation. We did it back in the day. Now, this was not ordinary, this was not typical armor. I'm sure this was probably a lord's armor or a some, ex some extremely wealthy person's armor. But my point is that that is, uh, this might seem like, isn't that kind of ridiculous? Perhaps, but n we did that. And it was designed to, in this case, embody the, uh, the spirit of your nation. So this is a uh, Capellan one. This is for the, uh, the Capellan Confederation. They, they are influenced by Chinese, like by the Han Dynasty and whatnot. The, and that's why it's called the Yu Huang. Anyways, that's, that's the point I'm going for. And then we got a House Calderon. House Calderon is the dynastic ruling house of Taurus, the Taurian homeworld, and the Taurian Concordat. The line is descended from Samantha Calderon, who founded the first colony on Taurus in 2253. Members of House Calderon are considered fair, egalitarian, and pragmatic in their decisions. Yeah, the, the Taurians are known to be a pretty no-nonsense group. Well, that's it. Commander? So... Hopefully you've learned a little bit about the, the, the crew members, a little bit about the Battletech history. And like I said, all of these 0.5 episodes, you can skip them if you, if, you're not, if you just want to see the action. Feel free to skip them. I will do them whenever there's reading, just to get the reading out of the way so they don't interfere with the primary episodes. And yeah, and like I said, we get to kind of look back at the history of... Battletech, because like I said, this is a, a a very childhood formative series for me. I've followed child, uh, you know, um, Battletech. I tried to read even the books when I was a kid. Didn't understand a lick of the books, but I still read them anyways, even though I don't, I didn't remember a single thing about them. Because uh, I tried to read them while I was in elementary school. That's how in the battle I was in like fourth grade, and I was trying to read like Battletech novels, which are not children's books. They're not even for they're they're for adults, like. Battletech was not made for kids, it was made for adults. Because like I said, it's a, it's a wargaming series where you paint your miniatures and whatnot. But uh, yeah, at any rate, that's going to be this uh, episode. I hope you enjoy this reading of the story and the lore. If you wanted me to read the tutorials, I don't think it's necessary, but let me know and yeah, I'll read the tutorials as well. But at any rate, that's the end of this episode. Hopefully I don't get demonetized. Like this video if it was entertaining. Subscribe for future Battletech content. And of course, remember that you don't have to be good to get good.